Jack Hogger coming to you from Watchmen Studios with another Watchmen video broadcast. We're going to call this one the CRISPR Apocalypse. Uh, the word apocalypse basically doesn't mean like, you know, the explosions and killing everybody at the end of the world. The word apocalypse to, comes from the Greek word. And it's actually like the Greek title for the last book of the Bible, Book of Revelation. So the, when the Bible says the revelation of Jesus Christ, it is referred to as the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. Because in the book of Revelation, Christ then is revealed to be the Savior of the world. Now, this is really really important when it comes to talking about CRISPR. If you don't know what that is, it's a C-R-I-S-P-R, -S and it's a something, 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 palindrome, something. I can't remember all of it, but that's what it stands for. But here's what it does. CRISPR, they, we've known about CRISPR since the 1980s. We found out that a bacteria, here's sort of how it works, a bacteria uh, can go and cut out a piece of virus DNA that got attached to it. These little single-celled organisms had a DNA copy of what viruses were lethal to it, and they would read these little amoebas, these one-celled organisms, would read their own DNA and look to see if there was any um, um, virus DNA attached to them that could kill them because they had a, a copy of the virus DNA built into its DNA. And when they found the virus attached to its DNA, they cut it out used an enzyme to cut out that portion of DNA and discard it and then put the two pieces back together again. So science has known about CRISPR and how it works for years. But at some point, they figured out that that's the way that science then can rewrite DNA. Not just a one-celled organism's DNA, but everything's DNA. Everything's DNA. Every tree, every animal, every bug, every fish, every bird. We can do, we can now do, and when I say we, I'm not talking about me, because I'm not doing it, but every scientists in the world can do this. Kids can do this at home. They have kits that they sell for teenagers to use CRISPR to change the DNA of some little single-celled organism. Kids are doing this in their bedrooms, in their basements, science projects, okay? That's how easy it is. And now it's like CRISPR 2.0. But let's take a look at some of the stories that I've collected over the years. This one right here, synthetic biology. The, uh, notice the synthetic biology. Stop, and th stop right here. Stop and think about that. Synthetic biology. What does synthetic mean? Biology is the study of bio. Two, two words put together. Logos, the study of bios is life. Biology is the study of every living thing and how things are like. You know, there's a difference between me and this pen. I'm alive and have DNA that runs my system. This pen is dead. It's a piece of, it's metal. It's all it is. Plastic, put together. So biology doesn't study pens. It studies this. So synthetic biology is not concerned about making a better pen. It's concerned with changing biology. Every 
source every living creature on this planet altered in somehow some way that's that's coming that's the CRISPR apocalypse the revelation of what CRISPR really is is what we're going to focus on synthetic biology means man made it I play a synthesizer if you watch our church service I'm up on the stage and I have this electric piano and I can punch buttons and make it produce all kinds of sounds those sounds are not real they are not original I can make a violin or piano or a flute but there's not actually some little guy in there playing a flute in, into a microphone they're all synthetic sounds they're man-made sounds now we're talking about man-made biology well who made biology God did and this is the, the two schools of thought is that God made biology biology made itself that's stupid, but that's what a, a majority of the people on the earth believe, that biology makes biology. And a very few of us actually believe that God made all living creatures. So now man is, because we ate the tree, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what the serpent promised Eve is coming to pass ye shall be as gods we're, we're gaining the knowledge that people with much higher mentality than humans can do we're getting there we're getting that knowledge synthetic biology the engineering of living organisms could soon start changing everything this was an article, I went back in my notes, my Evernotes. I started Evernotes, I can't remember what year. 2011, 2012, 2013, somewhere around in there. But I found this article all the way back from 2013. Here's, here's another one from Stephen Hawking, the physicist in the wheelchair who talks through a synthesized voice. Here's what he said, designer baby CRISPR warning in ethics debate. Designer baby technology could give rise to illegal superhumans. And he's not, these articles were from like 2013, 2014, 2015. It's 2019. So we're five years into the CRISPR revolution. And I've been saying this for a while. That we're, we have entered into, we officially entered into the CRISPR age. And what CRISPR ends up being is a savior, a type or a replacement for Jesus Christ. That's what it ends up being. Now I'm going to go to a verse in 1 Samuel chapter 4 and I'll explain the context of what I'm seeing here with CRISPR making different babies or humans than the ones God made. I'm going to explain it. 1 Samuel chapter 4. Now I'll give you the context. 1 Samuel chapter 4, Eli is the high priest. Hophni and Phinehas are his two wicked, evil sons that God is judging them. And they were, uh, they were terrible guys, rotten, rotten to the core. Spoiled brat preacher's kids. So anyway, um, they, they're going to war against the Philistines. Philistines... Are, have got one up on them and they're, and they're beating them. So the Israelites find the Ark of the Covenant. I want you to understand what the Ark of the Covenant represents. In one way it represents the throne of God. It's, where, it's the seat of God. It's the mercy seat of God. It's God's throne. Carried by four Levite priests just like in Ezekiel 1. The, the chariot of God with the four angels, the four cherubs, four living creatures. But then when they take the typology of the ark and apply it to the human body, the ark, 
and I'll get into this a little bit later on, the ark was in the tabernacle. The tabernacle is a picture of every cell in our body. The cell wall is the tabernacle wall. You have the sanctuary, that's the nucleus. And inside the nucleus, you have the most holy place where the ark of the covenant was. And what was in the ark of the covenant? A copy of this book. A copy of the book of Moses, the law written by Moses, but the words given to him by God himself. Okay? So, the Israelites take that Ark of the Covenant out because they think, while we have this, God has to be with us. They're tempting God is what they're doing. Surely God will not allow his holy altar, his holy throne to be captured by the Philistines. So, they felt like as long as we had as long as we had a religious icon, as long as we had our idol with us, they can't beat us. That's what they thought. And they said, they said, the Israelites said, in 1 Samuel 4, you look it up, it will save us. Meaning the Ark of the Covenant. Not God. It. It will save us. We're talking about replacement savior. So, they, the, the, what happens is Philistines prevail over the Israelites, steal the Ark of the Covenant. God allows this to happen. A messenger comes back to Eli. Eli's the judge over Israel. He's the head of Israel. He's the high priest. He's the judge. And he wants to know what's going on. The young man tells him, <clears throat> uh, Eli, I, have, I hate to tell you this, but Hophni and Phinehas have been slain, your sons. Okay, what else are you not telling me? Well, the Ark of the Covenant has been taken by the Philistines. And when Eli heard that, he fell backwards. He was a big, fat man, old man. And he had a falling away. Boom. Fell backwards, probably broke his neck. He was fat and died right then and there. At that exact time then, Phineas' wife, this would be the grandson of Eli the priest, Phineas' wife is giving birth, and she's going to die in childbirth. So we're going to look at what the name of her child is, and we're going to relate it to CRISPR. 1 Samuel 4, 19, And his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she had heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory is departed, for the ark of God is taken. She names, now, I've said this, for every doctrine, for every prophecy in the Bible, there is a picture of it. Somewhere in your Bible, there's a picture of prophecy. So, what this is a picture of, 2 Thessalonians 2, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, translation, the rapture, when we're gathered to Christ in the air, that be not soon shaken in mind, nor be troubled. A shaking is going to take place. Just like shaking the fig trees with the mighty wind in Revelation 6. And what happens? All the stars fall. That's important. What I'm going to show you today. That be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you. People, please, please listen to me. I'm having a rough go of it this year. Okay? I don't mind telling you that. I don't mind. I, I never wanted. The, the very first Watchman broadcast I did, I promised. And that was 10 years ago, 2009. I said, I will be myself. I'm, this is me. Had a tough go of it this year. We've had a lot of things happen, a lot of tragedies. 
a lot of dissension, dissemblers. And my wife has cancer. So these things are very dear to me. My church, my wife, my family, very precious to me. And when I see the devil going after all of that, all of my family, all the church people, all of you guys, I'm telling you, hold on. And I know how hard that is. I know it. And I'm telling you, when we look back at the, at the timeline of our life, we will see that it wasn't us holding on to God. It was God holding on to us. My eyes fast, I just happened to look on Scripture today. It's when Jesus and the disciples were in the boat. The disciples said, Carest thou not that we perish? Of course he cares. So he said, Peace, be still. Storm's over with. That's the kind of stuff God does for his people. He doesn't leave them or forsake them. Do we get scared every now and then? Absolutely. Do we get worried? Yes. Do we get full of fear? Yes. Are we sometimes of little faith? Yep. So that's why we go back to the Word of God. We read things like this. Let no man deceive you by any means. No man. Let no man deceive you. So if you'll believe the words that are in this book, man will, cannot deceive you. This is very important, what I'm, what I'm talking about. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Remember Eli? Boom. That man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. The man of sin, son of perdition. He's a child being born. And he is, Ichabod is a type of this man of sin, the son of perdition. Because when he shows up, the glory is gone. God's glory is gone away. Now they have the replacement for Jesus Christ. And it says that, um, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. When the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant, where did they take it to? The city dump? They take it down to uh, Jones uh, Gold and Pawn Shop, and pawn it off? No, they took it to their idol, Dagon. Dagon represents the Antichrist, half human, half beast. That's who he represents. And he wanted that ark. That's the throne. That's Lucifer wanting to sit on the seat of God. Satan in Ezekiel 28 saying, I am God. I sit as God in the midst of the seas. Well, the Ark of the Covenant was in the midst of a, of a firmament that looked like a crystal sea. It's what we see in Ezekiel 1, Revelation chapter 4. By the way, our heart is surrounded by pericardium, which is a sack of water. And the four-chamber heart is the throne of God in the midst of the seas. Okay? So that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Let me show you this picture. Up on the screen, on the left, you have a picture of the tabernacle. On the right, you have a picture of the tabernacle. On the left, you have a picture of the human cell. On the right, you have a picture of the human cell. They're, they're the same. And not just human cell. Dog cells, oak tree cells, apple tree cells, vines, vineyard, like the vineyard of Christ. Every cell, most every cell, matches this same arrangement. You have a cell membrane, take a look at it, you have a cell membrane or cell wall, depending on if you're animal or vegetable. You have a cell membrane if you're animal because there's movement. A cell wall because it's rigid if you're a plant. Plants don't really move like we do. So theirs is more rigid. But anyway, that's the curtain around the tabernacle. Inside the nucleus, you have the, 
the chromosomes, which are the rolled up scrolls of the DNA. And in the tabernacle, in the most holy place, you had the Ark of the Covenant and a, and a rolled up scroll of the words that God gave to Moses. Moses wrote them down, wrote them down in Hebrew. Hebrew has 22 letters. The 22 amino acids that, in, including the stop and start codons, that write out the sentences of our genes. There, and there's a match between the Word of God and our DNA, or any other creature's DNA. And so I, I want you to, that's why I'm saying when all these people are, were warning years ago about CRISPR making these superhuman, illegal babies, designer babies, that's Ichabod. The glory will depart from those, from those creatures. I won't call them people because they're not. They are creatures because when they were created by their creator, they were created by the spoken word of God. Go read Genesis 1. Every act of creation God does, he uses his mouth to speak it into existence. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God said this. And every day of creation, God is saying this. God is speaking it into existence. So the fact that every living thing in this world has DNA, and DNA has a start and a stop codon, which is a period at the end of a sentence, a capital letter at the beginning of a new sentence. And then it has the letters that make the words that tell, tell this machine in our body how to take and add proteins together and how to fold them correctly and build the particular parts and pieces of our body, our skin, our fingernails, our hair, our internal organs, our bone, our blood, our mucus, everything in our body is designed by the DNA. The DNA is the, the, the design scheme of every living creature. And again, the two schools of thought, nature either wrote its own DNA or God wrote DNA. And if God wrote DNA, then God owns the copyright to it. Man doesn't. But because man doesn't believe that God wrote DNA, that nature wrote itself and it was all an accident, and that's, probably won't get to it today, it'll be the next one. But I'm gonna show you a video with this company that does this, and they're making billions of dollars on this thing using CRISPR. We knew it was coming. This is the big one here, okay? So Psalm 139, 16, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. And I've done this multiple times before, but I love this, every time I read this verse, I love it. I can't get enough of it. I've got my favorite. If you've listened to me long enough, you know I've got my favorite places in the Bible. Psalm 139, 16 is one of them. In thy book, all my members were written. This is Jesus saying, in thy book, all the members of my body are written. And the members of the body of Jesus Christ is the church. It's us. And our names are written in God's book. God is the one who made me the way I am. You don't like me? Tell God. <laughs> okay? Just go tell God. God, I don't like Mike Hoggard. Okay? God, God might say, you know, I don't like him either, but I don't like you either. I don't know. He loves us all. Amen? But what I'm saying to you is, if God wrote DNA, and that's what it says, thine in, David is saying, 3,000 years ago, God, in thy book, all my members were written. So David is telling us that nature didn't accidentally write DNA all by itself. God did. It's God's book. Therefore, 
God has rules that govern his book wherever it is, whether it's in us or it's in cattle or pigs or trees or fruit flies or mosquitoes, genetically altered mosquitoes flying around all over the place. Okay. Not the phrase is not genetically multiplied, uh, modified, genetically edited. That's the new phrase. Genetic editing. And what that means, like the editor of a newspaper. The editor of a newspaper, when these articles come to him from his reporters, he has the job of scratching out words he doesn't like. So he edits a document, scratches a word out, writes a word above it, use this word instead. That's what the editor does. Okay? That's because the editor felt that the reporter made a mistake, didn't use the right word. Well, let me tell you something about God. God doesn't make mistakes. God is not a man that he should lie. And God does not allow his word to become corrupt. He wrote it exactly the way he wanted it. And nobody has a right to edit it. So I'll, let me show that to you. Deuteronomy 4.2, You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. So think of the commandments as the book of, of our DNA. What, I mean, what is making our, our body, right? What is keeping us alive right now? What governs, what is it in our bodies right now that governs our bodies? It's not our doctors. It's not a pharmaceutical company. It's our DNA. Our DNA is the one calling the shots. The DNA is the one building the proteins, building the pieces to our bodies, the members of our body, according to how it was written. Now, you may say, well, I don't like how it was written. God did it for a reason. I trust him. I trust him. If I didn't, I promise you, I wouldn't be here. I would not sit down in front of another camera and tell you about the goodness of God. I trust him. My wife has cancer. I am not happy about that. I have been very depressed. Very worried. I love her. God allowed it to fulfill His purpose, and I trust Him. So I'm not to be... Jesus, here's another passage of Scripture that I just happened on today. Jesus told us, don't worry, I'm paraphrasing, don't worry about the one who can kill the body. Worry about the one who can kill the body and the soul. That's who you worry about. Okay? So he says, Deuteronomy 4, the commandments that I wrote unto you, put them in the Ark of the Covenant, put them in the nucleus, put them in the most holy place of the cell, the tabernacle. He said, those commandments, you're to keep them. And never go away from them. You're to keep them forever. Now, they were written on papyrus and animal skins, so they had to be copied. And the one thing about the Jews is they copied it correctly. They didn't, they didn't, if there was, a, if they had a manuscript error, they burnt the whole manuscript. They didn't, ha, didn't leave evidence that they made a mistake. Okay? And that's, that's our bodies. That's what happens. Every cell in my body is making new copies of the DNA of my body to preserve the life of my body. What happens when it's not transcripted right from one cell to another is that it causes cancer. Or scores of other problems. So that's the Old Testament. Old Testament says, God says, don't change my commandments, which are written in the 22 amino acids, 22 letters of Hebrew, that make the words, that make up the book, that make you my people. 
God said, I'm your father, you'll be my children. And if God is their father, he basically gave birth to them, conceived them with the seed, the incorruptible seed of the word of God. So now we go to Revelation 22, verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So we have two witnesses. The Bible says out of the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall every word be established. So we have the Old Testament telling us this is God's book. You don't, you don't change it. You don't diminish aught from it. You don't reduce it down. You don't take words down away from it. You don't add anything to it. When Moses came down with the law in his hand, God wrote it in stone, wrote it on the front and on the back on two tablets, four faces a piece. That's four for the Gospels. And the spiritual, it's a spiritual law. But anyway, it was written in stone so that it could not be altered. It was written on the front, on the back, because that, that means you can't add to it. There's no room. And it was written in stone, which means you cannot change it, cannot alter it. It was never to be altered, never to be changed. So in Revelation 22, the very last thing told you in the whole Bible is... Here's this book of prophecy. And that's what, D, that's what DNA is. When your mom and daddy conceived you and their genes joined together to form you, everything about you and your physical body and your ge genetic makeup and your flaws, your character, everything, all of that was written out before it ever happened. Some of you guys who have a mustache or a beard. You didn't, you didn't come out born with a mustache and a beard. You didn't have facial hair until, I don't know, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old. Somewhere. I hated those years. But that's when you started getting facial hair. It was already written in the DNA. It was prophesied that you were going to grow facial hair. And that's exactly what happened. And that is exactly what this is. So the schools of thought is, if nature writes DNA, we can take it over because it's out in the public domain. It doesn't belong to anybody. But if God wrote DNA, then the rules are we're not allowed to change it, ever. And the first time you see the word book used in the King James Bible, it's Genesis chapter 5. This is the book of the generations of it. See the word generations? Genes. Genetics. Generations. Because when Adam conceived children, they were in his likeness and in his image. He was in the likeness and the image of God. So much so that Luke in the lineage of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 3 goes Jesus backwards all the way through. You, you go through David, you go through Abraham, you go all the way to, the, to Adam. The Bible says Adam was the son of God. Made in the image and likeness of God. That's why we're not supposed to have idols. But anyway, it's the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man, the likeness of God made he him. So when God created Adam and his DNA, he created it the way he wanted it. After his likeness, the way he made it. And it's the same way with everybody. Now, I know that there are genetic diseases out there that are, are horrible. But there are none of those in heaven. None of them. And people can suffer through some of the worst genetic diseases. Cancer is a genetic disease for the most part. But there's no cancer in heaven. 
There's no corrupt DNA in heaven. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. It's not, there's no corruption in heaven. And so, yes, you, you or a child, your grandchild, your child may have a genetic disorder. It's part of this life. We all go through our hardships. I'm having a tough time dealing with my wife's cancer. It's hard on me knowing that that's there. Knowing what it did to her, what they had to do to her to get rid of it. It's one of the hardest things I've, been, I've ever gone through but I love my wife. And I pray for her every day, with tears every day. She's not, she's not dying, but eventually she will. Eventually I will, we all will. And in heaven, there's no imperfect DNA. And I want the second life more than I want the first life. And that's what this is all about. It's us not loving this world, wanting the next one. God will do enough things to you to get you to stop loving this world. And you'll say, God, I, I want to go home. Psalm 89, 34, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone from nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Now what does that mean? When God created every baby that's ever been born, when He spoke their DNA, you know, parents who have multiple children, those children are all different. You ever notice that? The Duggars, they had 20 children. All of them's different. Now you can tell they're Duggars, but they're all different from each other. Who made them? God did. God made them exactly the way He wanted them to be made. Exactly. Now, I'm going to make a statement. CRISPR babies cannot, when I say CRISPR babies, I'm going to show you articles where science is working now at this very present moment to genetically redesign the tabernacle of God in man's likeness, not God's. If they, if a, if a CRISPR baby has been genetically altered by the hands of man, they are not the son of Adam cannot be a son of God. It, it's a disqualification. It's what it is. It's just like when a baseball player hits a ball with his bat and the bat breaks, the umpire picks it up, finds out there's cork in the bat, which gives the bat a little bit more spring to it. He finds out this cork in the bat, he throws the batter out, and that batter's going to be suspended for a few games. It's happened before. Sammy Sosa did it. Or when some of these athletes juice up, you know what I mean? Start taking steroids, which are illegal, to juice up their body to enhance themselves so they can get paid more money for playing sports. It's cheating, it's what it is. They're disqualified. CRISPR babies will be disqualified because they're not the way God spoke their DNA. Man changed it. Now he may think he's doing it for the better, but he's not because man doesn't understand that nature did not just accidentally write DNA.
God wrote every person and every living creature's DNA the way he wanted it. He wrote it his way. He did it his way. He owns it. So we read this verse, 2 Thessalonians. He that he's, he is God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Can it qualify as the temple of God if God himself did not build it? The answer, I believe, is no. And I'm, I'm wrestling. I'm struggling. Because I've actually said to myself, Mike, what if the cancer comes back in, in, in my wife and they say we have this revolutionary new way to get rid of your wife's cancer? This is real to me now. It's not just some imaginary thing. It's real. And what I'm saying to you is I would rather die or watch somebody I love die and go to heaven than I would for them to be disqualified from being able for God to dwell in their temple. Hebrews 9.24, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Acts chapter 7, verse 48, Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. If, if man built the temple, God doesn't dwell in it. It's, it's, it's the simple rules. It's just very simple, straightforward. If man built that temple, God cannot dwell in it. Everybody's talking about, oh, the Jews are going to build the third temple. Maybe, I don't know. If they do, when Christ comes, he's going to lay it every bit of it flat. He's going to build it himself. He pitches his own tent, his own tabernacle. The book of Hebrews tells us that. So I absolutely, I'm, I'm re-examining how I'm thinking about this and how I'm seeing it because now, now it's a reality in my life. And I trust God. And only God. And I know now that God wrote the DNA of my body, my wife's body, your body, people everywhere around the world. God wrote that. For, and we've already discovered, you and I have already discovered what happens when men change the Bible. We've already figured that one out, haven't we? What happens when men change the Word of God? Well, it produces corrupt fruit. And so man wanting to alter the Word of God in every living creature. See, we're not just talking about humans. We're talking about every species. When, I'll go back to that article. Synthetic biology, the engineering of living organisms, could soon start changing everything. Stephen Hawking saying, designer baby CRISPR, warning in ethics debate, designer baby technology could give rise to illegal superhumans. Now, where do you think the idea for changing man's DNA is really coming from? 
do we think that scientists are these benevolent men and women who are all about the pious, benevolent, loving of humankind, not wanting to see anybody suffer, so let's cure all their diseases. Do you believe that? Maybe, maybe some of them. I don't think I could judge every one of them. But we know for a fact that CRISPR is big moolah. That's big money. There's even a fight in the courts over who owns the rights to CRISPR and how it's used. How, how it was, who developed it, who got it going, who, who figured it out. Je, the name Jennifer Doudna, and it's funny that her last name is D-O-U-D-N-A. Doudna. And she is the one claiming she discovered the CRISPR. CRISPR cuts, and here's the process, CRISPR cuts out this, this, this one-celled organism, scans a person's DNA in a cell, finds a particular verse, I'll say it that way, finds a particular verse, and cuts it out with enzyme scissors, enzyme knife, cuts out that DNA, discards it, and either puts the two ends together or it adds something in its place. So CRISPR at its core, used by mankind, is illegal in God's, in God's kingdom. It's illegal. It's against God's law. God said, don't do it. Don't alter the thing that comes out of my mouth. I'm the Lord, your God. I'm the boss. I'm the one in charge. No, I do not give you permission to change the Bible. No, I do not, do not give you permission to change DNA. So a movie comes out based upon an 80s arcade game called Rampage. And in fact, if you watch this movie, I noticed that the, the, the brother and the sister who own the um, Intergene Corporation that has used CRISPR to make all these mutations and everything like that, if you look in some of the scenes, you can see that the guy has this Rampage arcade box in his, in his high up office. Okay, you see it in the background, I noticed that. So it's based on that, but they updated the story. Okay, it's Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. Man, that guy's got muscles. And he's a good actor, okay? But it's all, here's what happens. Take a look at this scene here. I'm not showing you a, a film clip. I'm showing you a graphic picture, screen capture of what happens. There is a space station. This is the movie. There's a space station called the Athena. Stop right here. Athena is a goddess. A goddess is always Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of Harlot, the mother. The mother the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. She's the one that gives birth to them. Okay, you think about that. So up in this space station, the Athena, the opening scene is they've been doing experiments up there because it's not illegal up in space. The laws don't apply. And they have this mutated rat beast that's destroying the space station. And the last remaining astronaut is able to get four tubes. Think about it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. She's able to get four tubes of the, um, it's some kind of uh, mist or something in these canisters that if it's released and you inhale it, you, you're putting all of that in you. These four canisters into her ejection pod, her rescue pod. She makes it, but the rat has clawed up and tore up the window of her escape pod. And as she's hitting the atmosphere of the earth, the glass is breaking and the escape pod breaks up into, take a look at the picture. 
How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? The dragon taking a third of the angels and casting them down to the earth. You see that? It's a falling star. Revelation 9, I saw a star fall from heaven, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. These four canisters end up altering four creatures. A wolf, an alligator, uh, let's see here, what was the other one? I can't remember. And then Dwayne Johnson's gorilla. They literally are going on rampages, okay? But it's this idea that these, that the change of the DNA is coming down from the heavens. That's the imagery of that movie, okay? So then about halfway through the movie, Dwayne Johnson meets up with one of the scientists who used to work for the Wyden Corporation, the Energy Corporation, she used to work there, and she's explaining to Dwayne Johnson's character what happened. Take a look at the screenshots here. Look at, look at what she pulled up. Great white shark, and then it says indeterminate growth. I'm going to explain that. Then down later on, she flips up blue whale growth rate. Now let me stop right here. See, the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be, and there is no new thing under the sun. It's already been done. Genesis chapter 6. We know, I just did a, a three-part series called Giants for Those Who Don't Believe to give you the scripture back, backing for what we believe that the sons of God really were of the angelic race, and the Bible backs that up 100%. So here in Genesis 6, we have the sons of God falling down from heaven, mingling themselves with the daughters of men who give birth to these CRISPR babies, to these genetic hybrid creatures that when... Moses sent the 12 spies into Israel. The spies came back and said that they were in our sight, or we were in our sight as grasshoppers to them, so we were in their sight. A ratio of man to giant. And here's why I'm saying this. The earthly realm is a shadow of the heavenly realm. Hebrews tells us that. This is not the real. The real's up, up there. And for everything that happens here, it is a shadow or a reflection of what happens in the spiritual realm, including creatures. There are there are living beasts on this earth and there are spirit beasts in the spiritual realm. The dragon, Satan's one of them. He's a dragon, he's a serpent, but he's a spiritual one, not a physical one, not part of nature. Okay? So here's why I'm saying this. They're creatures. You and I have in our genetics what's something that determines determinate growth. In other words, most people are going to be about the same size. Almost everybody. About the same size. We grow from a baby through our adolescence into our teenage years. We get into our 20s and it sort of winds down. And we all stop growing this way, so we end up growing this way but it's called determinate growth. Most species on this earth have determinate growth. There are some who don't. They have what's called indeterminate growth, and that's what she was showing him. This is why, you're, she's son of, this is why George, your monkey, your gorilla, is so big now. It's because he found one of the canisters, inhaled the, the green mist that fell from heaven, the mist, 
that's the dew from heaven that he inhaled it and now all of a sudden he's got these he's in attack mode and he's growing and she's showing him there are certain creatures that never stop growing reptiles serpents dragons as long as they live they never stop growing they have indeterminate growth there's there's something in their DNA that doesn't block their length or how big they get which is why I believe we had dinosaurs before the flood and probably after the flood before the flood they were allowed to live into the hundreds of years made them huge after the flood maybe not so much but they were still big enough so that when God confronted Job in Job chapter 40 and 41 with behemoth and Leviathan he's saying consider these how big they are these were dinosaurs these were dragons Leviathan is what he called it Leviathan is a dragon a fire breathing dragon but anyway dragons serpents do have indeterminate growth they grow as long as they're alive whales indeterminate growth as long as they're alive they keep growing they don't stop the is if they live I don't know what the lifespan of a whale is but if it lives 50 to 100 years it's gonna grow every year and never stop that's what I think brings itself into the Giants is that they were their genetics they inherited certain traits from their God fathers and they never stopped growing while they were alive never did now it to me it was interesting I caught this she shows a whale whales have indeterminate growth where they never stop growing and what's interesting Day five, can you think of a story that has something to do with a whale? Well, there's more than one. On day five of creation, five is linked with like the fifth trumpet and the star falls and opens the bottomless pit, right? Fifth day of creation, God creates whales. Then we have Jonah, okay? But we have another verse that attaches the idea that the Antichrist who is seen in Ezekiel 32 as Pharaoh I'll read it to you son of man take up a lamentation for Pharaoh king of Egypt and say unto him thou art like a young lion of the nations and thou art as a whale in the seas thou camest forth with thy rivers and troublest the waters with thy feet foulest their rivers and the Hebrew word here, and I'm not using this to alter the Bible, I'm using this to give you some background. The Hebrew word here is tanin. And tanin is the same word used in Genesis chapter 1 when God created great whales, tanin. Tanin is translated in one place, sea monsters. every place in the Old Testament where you find dragons the word is tanin when Moses and Aaron when they cast the rod of Moses down and it became a serpent the Hebrew word tanin tanin tanin's a dragon Leviathan sea monsters beasts a picture of the Antichrist now I don't I don't know if the Antichrist is going to be a giant but it's interesting to me that they use this imagery in this movie don't show it for very long they use this imagery in this movie to tell you that to link whales with indeterminate growth and Pharaoh is as a whale in the seas could be a giant I don't know Here's another article. This is a little bit more up to date. This is September 9 11, 2011.
2019, 9-11. Chinese scientists edit DNA in an attempt to cure man's cancer and his HIV. I knew it. I knew it. HIV, nobody knows where it came from. Just out of the blue now, this disease. And I know people who have it. Okay? And I know how they got it. And we don't know where HIV, they say it came from monkeys. Who got it from monkeys? Okay. Maybe it was genetically made, I don't know. But now you got scores of thousands of people all over the world with HIV. And now we're going to use CRISPR to cure their cancer and... We're going to cure his HIV while we're doing it. He's in here for an oil change, but we're going to give him an oil change and we're going to rotate his tires. We're going to give him the works here. While we got him on the table, we're going to do the whole thing. That just came out. So we're all ready. You see, that stuff, the, what they're doing in China is illegal in the United States, supposedly. But I don't believe that Nobody in the United States is doing it, is not doing it. I don't believe that. I believe there's labs, got to be labs somewhere. Military, private corporations. Are you kidding me? This is so easily done and so cheaply done. It could be done practically anywhere. The money hidden so you never find out they're doing it. But China has no restrictions on this. Neither does North Korea. And I watched a video the other night, right before I went to bed, that literally scared me. And it was a, it was a sort of a cartoonish type movie about CRISPR. And it said in this video what I've been saying. What if Kim Jong-un, the un-Kim, gets a hold of CRISPR and starts making super soldiers? He doesn't care how many he has to kill before he figures out how to do it. He doesn't care. And there's nothing to stop him. Nothing to stop him. And this video used that illustration of what if North Korea or China or Russia or any of these other nations where they don't have the restrictions the United States and, and Great Britain has, what if they just wanted to start remaking the human temple? What if? It's not a what if anymore. They're doing it. Chinese scientists edit DNA in an attempt to cure man's cancer and his HIV. Here's another one. Scientists attempt controversial experiment to edit, and I'm going to say it the Bible way, to edit DNA in human seed using CRISPR. Are you kidding me? Because just changing a few cells to stop or prevent a disease, that's one thing. I, I don't know about that. But then to change the man's seed so that every child that he produces has been genetically edited. It is a temple built with man's hands. So the movie Rampage, the seed that brought the transformation came down from the heavens. They made that very clear in that movie. I didn't catch it the first time I watched it. Caught it the second time. Came down from the heavens. Daniel 2. The fourth kingdom. I've covered this so many times, but it, here's where it fits. That, that last story. Scientists attempt controversial experiment to edit DNA in human seed. The seed 
of men. See, I'm going to use the word once. Only men have sperm. So Daniel chapter 2. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. And that article is leading up to the time and it's coming and it's any day any day we're living in very serious times I'm fighting battles like you would not believe devils crawling all over me it's been been the hardest year okay and I get knocked down I get back up I'm getting up a little bit slower now but I'm getting up and I think it could very well be this way not just with me but with a lot of people who serve God believe this book because I've said this before now it's a reality in my life so my wife has cancer they think they got it all but what if our insurance company said we're gonna drop your coverage unless your wife has this procedure done to rewrite I don't even, I don't even want to say it my wife I love her she's the one that just like that can bring me out of the darkest places she can just touch me and all of my fears and everything's gone just like that I don't want to lose her but I know what my Bible says and I I'm gonna trust God hard as that sounds I'm gonna trust God will you you have to th start thinking about it now and I'm not done I've got some more to show you that's there was a video that came out really got my attention and I'm gonna show you screen captures and what they're saying about it in this next portion but right now, this is for real. It's the world we're living in right now. And the what if scenarios that I've been talking about for years are now, we're very close to that. Very close. And again, trust in the Lord with all your heart lean not under your own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him and so when I look back in the history of my life it wasn't me hanging on to God thank God it was God holding on to me and I hope and trust he's holding on to you as well that's what I hope for Next time uh, we do this, I'm going to show you the, the new Savior. The new Savior is CRISPR. I've got the books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John right here. This is the four Gospels. This is where our Savior is. This is what binds the Old and the New Testament together, just like in DNA. 
next week I'm going to show you the new Savior. He's coming. Soon. You are the reason why I do what I do. I love you. The encouragement, the prayers, the letters, the cards. I don't have time to answer them all back. I am... I, spend most of my time studying for, for the next thing I'm doing, the next thing I'm doing, the next thing I'm doing, doing it for you. But I'm, I'm telling you, I appreciate every one, of, every one of the letters, the long letters, the short letters, just the note saying, Pastor, we love you, we're praying for you. I could use some of those about now. Okay? I pray for my wife. I love you. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.